Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. So some of you may know that Jeremy and I do a weekly show called Projections, but one of the things that we haven't covered on Tested is, well, actual projections, projection mapping. <laughs> right, so this doesn't necessarily fit into that bucket, but projection mapping is just very, very cool. Now, like about a year ago, we were talking on the podcast about how people at Christmas time or holidays in general, they take these uh, lights, lasers, and they project them on the side of their house, and it just looks kind of cheesy. I mean, it looks very warped and, and you know, not like projection mapping should. Right, where the light actually conforms itself to the geometry of the object you're projecting Exactly, at. exactly. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if like somebody made a tool that allowed anybody to projection map onto their house or in their rooms or an object or whatever you want. And somebody has. A new company called Lightform just debuted a product which is that for consumers and prosumers. So we went to visit their HQ and chat with their CEO about their technology and check out their Lightform projection mapping device. Brett, thank you so much for having us here. Yeah, of course. I'm super thank stoked you. to see Lightform. Uh, so you guys make this device. I've been working on it for a couple of years. It is a projection mapping device? Yes, exactly. So it's a, a hardware and a software solution purpose-built for projected AR or projection mapping. Uh, so what the Lightform is, is it's a high-resolution camera. So it's a 4K color camera. There's a computer inside of this. And you take this and you actually mount it onto almost any projector. And so now it's attached, and what we've done is we've turned this projector into a 3D scanner. So we can take this, we can point it at any object in the real world, we get a 3D scan of it, and then we can apply magical effects, or we can apply information onto the real world using projection. I've seen projection mapping in a variety of places. Mm -hmm. I've seen amusement parks, like Disneyland, I've seen retail locations, even like eSports events, but not really in the consumer space. Um, this device looks really small and compact. How does this compare to something that like a Disney would use for a theme park? Yep. Yeah, so we actually got into projection about uh, 10 years ago while at Disney Imagineering. Um, so I was at Disney Imagineering, Phil was touring with Skrillex doing big projected visuals. So Lightform is all about taking those big kind of theme park level uh, magical experiences and then boiling down into uh, a solution that is accessible for any designer to create projected AR. Um, so. Uh, we'll talk about kind of what that scanning process is. So Lightform is designed to, to scan uh, static scenes and then within a couple of minutes create super compelling uh, magical effects. We have a couple minutes right now. Can you walk me through yes, one definitely. of those processes? All right, so we'll set this one to the side and go to our uh, demo unit over here. So let me just grab a Stormtrooper helmet here. All right. And then we actually 3D printed uh, a tested logo cool. over on the Form 1 printer over there. So I'm just going to set these objects down. And then what we're going to do is we're going to scan it. So uh, right now, the camera on the laptop, you can actually see a live feed of what the camera is seeing. And then Phil is going to trigger um, a scan. So we'll see what that looks like. So projection mapping, really, it's kind of backwards. You map first, and then you project on the computer's understanding of the shape and sizes of the yes. real world. And that's actually why we call this projected AR and not projection mapping, because we mm. take the mapping out of projection mapping. So it's more about the experience and the content that you can create and less about that painful process of mapping pixels onto objects. In a lot of AR devices we've seen, mapping the world, understanding the shapes and sizes of the world is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. How does this do it? Because here I see it's, it's one lens, yep. right? You're not using like what a Kinect would have in terms of like IR sensors, blasters, or stereo even. How does this understand the shape of that? Yep. So uh, it is stereo, and it's stereo because um, you can think of stereo as like left eye, right eye, right? Yep. And that's how we see in 3D. Uh, but the left eye is the camera of the light form, and the right eye is the projector. So they're actually talking to each other through light. So those patterns that we saw were black and white patterns. Mm. Those were zeros and ones. So it was actually sending binary code to each other through light. And at the end of the day, what we end up getting is a projector resolution scan. So you can get a 1080p scan of whatever you point at, so much higher than a real-time depth sensor. Um, and we can also use a projector with different lenses. So you can actually zoom in and out of the, the lens on that projector. You could use um, different lensing projectors. Uh, and we are capable of scanning any scene from three feet to infinity. So you can scan a coffee cup, a stormtrooper mask, or a building across the street. And so you are projector agnostic. 
Yep, and projector the, agnostic. So any normal throw projector is what the LF1 supports. Projectors have a wide, wide range of throws, like a small Pico projector and, and the angles. You, but you could mount this on a small thing, have it behind your television, and, and it would still work fine? Yep. Yeah, so it's actually designed to be mounted um, with adhesive. So you literally just peel off uh, a sticker, plop it onto any projector. You can put it on the top or the bottom, plug in HDMI and the power, and then you're good to go. You turn your projector into a 3D scanner. The calibration, though, what about the calibration between the scanner and... We do that all automatically using computer vision. So uh, we're all PhDs in computer vision and design uh, and spent two years building a system where you don't have to worry about any of that. We just do it for you. All right. Well, the scan seems to be done. That was yep. much faster than a couple minutes. Uh, what does the computer know about this world now? So if we, uh, on Phil's screen, you can actually see that we have the scan. So we have the color information. Uh, and then we also have the depth behind that. Okay. Um, so we have a projector resolution depth and color scan. Uh, and we're going to use that to then um, outline an object in the scene and apply a magical effect to it. You can be saying projector resolution. So the higher the resolution of a projector, the better fidelity your scan is. Correct. Uh, up to 1080p. So the yeah. hardware is designed to be cheap, uh, so we support up to um, 1080p. So there's no understanding of what the scene is, that this is a helmet or it's a head or you know it's a box. You're manually masking, um, but what tools does the system enable to help you with that masking? So we have uh, a bunch of easy things that you would expect in like Adobe Suite. Um, so we have a pen tool that we spend a bunch of time on for quickly outlining an object. So you just have to kind of trace an object. We also have a quick select tool, so quick select and magic wand like mm. Photoshop has. Um, but instead of just having color, we use depth as well. So it's not just looking for outlines or dark shapes. So you could select a white coffee cup on a white table okay. and select the coffee cup using depth instead ah. of color. Okay, so you want to you're selecting the outline here, mm -hmm. right? Picking out those those shapes, um, you can tweak, I assume, you know, and, and refine your your mask. Yep. And then with that mask, put a photo or a video on this. So you can do uh, images or videos. So you can use your existing assets. But what we're really excited about is these projected AR effects. So these are intelligent effects that are actually using the color and the 3D scan of the scene. Um, so this is actually wiping in depth through the object. Um, we call this one digital fade. Um, so there's a library of these effects, and these effects are actually real time. So they're running on the device, on the computer that is the, the Lightform LF1. Not compiling, exporting as video. Yeah, these are shaders, right? So there are shaders um, that are running on the device in real time. Um, and what we can actually do is we can control them. Um, so you can go over here oh, uh, and you can out. actually control different parameters of the effects. Uh, and then Phil will show you um, mapping. Uh, we have this tested logo here, and Phil will show the pen tool mapping the tested logo and applying another effect. Very so cool. we're publishing that right now. So it's actually saving the project file, transmitting it to the light form, and then playing it back into the real world. Uh, so that's the workflow, right? You're, working, you're creating your mass, you're adding an effect, your library of effects, maybe adjusting some variables in there, stacking the effects mm -hmm. as possible, and then once you get published, that all sends to the light form, you don't need to have a connected computer. Correct. So the coolest thing is Phil could actually close his laptop and walk away, and we just made permanently deployed magic. Mm. It all runs locally. So what's inside here, essentially, is like a small computer with yeah. HDMI output. It's a quad-core A9 processor. Um, it's designed to be permanently installed. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, if you're an AV installer, this is actually a fanless design, and there's onboard storage, so it's not like an SD card that's going to fail over time. Yeah. So the idea is that it's computer vision hardware that makes it really easy to create compelling scenes in seconds, but then you can permanently deploy this if you're an art gallery uh, you know, in your house or uh, at a retail store. Now, because you're running real-time effects on here and even combining that potentially with static images, videos, what's the load of this machine? Can you, at some point, do you lose frame rate? Is, yep. is there a maximum complexity you have for this? Yep. It's very easy for an artist to throw things at a computer to make it run really slow, because um, it's basically a mobile phone processor. Uh, and so what we do is we intelligently try and uh, kind of optimize the scene. So we'll take, if you create a bunch of really um, complex effects like a particle system, we'll actually render that to a video file and send mm. the video file to the device. Okay. Um, so then you can have a mix of passive and interactive content running on the device, but you don't have to worry about uh, you know, kind of optimizing your content. We do that for you. That, this is super cool. I, I know this is something you guys bought and you have run this demo before, but the whole scan to finish was just a couple minutes and this looks really neat. 
Yeah, so we actually uh, have you brought in an object. Yes. Um, so now we're going to map an object that you chose, not us. And I want to get my hands on that software. Yes, definitely. All right, let's check it out. Sounds good. So we brought something from our office, of course, the Zorg ZF1 from the Fifth Element. Uh, nice static prop, pretty complex. And Phil here, uh, you guys have scanned this. Yeah, we have. So uh, we have our projector scan as our, as our background here. So uh, again, it's, it's really easy to actually go in and use this as a reference as we're um, tracing the outlines. Um, we can do a, a quick selection, just kind of select all the gray areas and then convert that to vector. Uh, in this case, we've actually gone and um, created, a, created a mask ourselves. Um, took only a, a few minutes. And what we can do uh, is if we want to actually interactively edit this mask, I can stream the preview uh, to the device. So I have a crosshair now that's out in the real world. And if I wanted to uh, just tweak some of that uh, barrel right there, I could go and get that really precisely aligned. And so everything that's bright here is within the mask. Correct, yes. So we're projecting white to represent the, the mask uh, of the area that you're going to be mapping. OK. Uh, and then what's really handy is this interactive crosshair. So um, as I'm kind of editing these points in the real world, I can see exactly uh, where they lie. So you know, bring this point in a little right, bit, right. bring that point out a little bit. And then we have a, a kind of sub-pixel accuracy here. So we can scroll way in, and we can actually get down to um, you know, our, our Bezier handles. And this is when you really want to get it nice and precise. Um, but uh, for most applications, you can just do kind of a rough selection. And, and that's going to be important because the yeah. angle of this projector is going to be different, and where the shadows kind of overlap. Yeah. You want to fine tune that. If I shift this, though, you'll need the rescan. Yeah, correct. So uh, by vectorizing the mask outline, it's very easy for us to just select that whole shape and then uh, do a transformation on it and move it. Um, on our roadmap, we have uh, what we call auto fine tune, which mm. uh, will account for small shifts in uh, projector movement or object movement. So typically when you have an installation going for a while, um, you know, things heat up, cool down, buildings move a little bit here right. and there, and you can notice that, uh, you know, five pixel offset. Uh, so with computer vision, we'll actually be able to help solve that for you. And that's for like kind of lateral movements or just fixed plane scale changes. If I do a big rotation or even a slight rotation, you'll need to tweak that mask manually. Uh, correct. Uh, you will, you will want to go in and, and uh, if there's significant changes to the scene, uh, tweak your Bezier handles a little bit. Um, but what's nice about our instant effects is that the content underlying, you don't have to recreate that. Mm. Uh, you're actually able to uh, just apply that. And with the new scan and the new underlying projector pixels, that content just kind of works right. right away. Exactly how you had seen it before. Correct, yeah. yeah. So um, this one, um, we actually you know, have a, some nice depth data there. Oh, that's cool. So uh, what I'll do is I'll bring up our effects pane. And we'll go and uh, use a, a depth trace effect. So this is an effect that's actually using the underlying depth data. Uh, I'll go ahead and insert that. And then we can actually publish that. So you do see a preview of the effect Correct. as it's playing using that same depth data, the same visual data the edge data. Um, Correct. And we actually have, um, in our software, we also have a preview tab, which uh, will allow you to uh, preview uh, what you know, kind of a more photo accurate uh, representation of the scene would look like mm -hmm. while you're in the software. Um, let's, uh, let's also give uh, our favorite digital fade a try. And then we'll switch back to our color there and publish that. And then what can you do after you've published the scene? Like, what kind of tweaks can you do to this animation? Yeah, so um, I actually have this MIDI controller hooked up. So we support OSC, as you saw before, um, MIDI, and then uh, other kind of input-output devices. So I can actually uh, interactively adjust the speed and uh, color of uh, this effect. Um, so I can change it to more of like a yellowish or a reddish and then actually speed it up or slow it down a little bit. So we could spend a fair amount of time going through and actually mapping uh, the various components and portions of this device. But um, we end up with uh, you know, quite a few effects. And then we also have stock video integration. So yeah, as I would say, everything here so far has been rendered. Yep. I would love to see what a video looks like. Or Yep. So I'll go ahead and I can import um, a label into our software. 
Cool. And so now we've got kind of what you would expect um, for a traditional uh, mapping tool. So I can actually go ahead and I can then um, adjust our mask. Um, I can go ahead and adjust the underlying shape or structure. And so if I wanted to actually uh, add a little call out, so say we're doing like a museum exhibit um, mm -hmm. for, our, for our collection, um, go ahead and map that. Luckily, I have this nice grid on the pegboard there. And it can help me align it. Otherwise, mapping text is like a pretty difficult problem just to get you know your alignment with your scene properly. But having that underlying scan there is really handy for this. And the type of transforms you can do are beyond just the skew? Correct, yeah. Um, so I could actually also scale the content within this. Um, we also have like a mesh warping. So say you had like a cylindrical or spherical object, mm -hmm. uh, you could actually take your content and warp it around that very easily. You know, seeing text there occurs to me that dynamic content would be really interesting. Yes. Right now it's effects, which is rendered in real time and imported images, but what type of dynamic content could you potentially put on this? So um, we'll have a fair amount of uh, social media integrations. So you could display uh, your Twitter feed mm. uh, and have, you know, say you're a business and you wanted to uh, display a hashtag. Um, you could actually have that kind of integrated, and then that would be dynamically populated based on uh, uh, your uh, hookups with your different social media. And um, then you could also have effects and video content running simultaneously. That is all so super cool. You mind if I try my hand at it and create some effects? Yeah, please. I might, uh, I might scoot this label up a little bit for you there so we can see, see it a little better. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So Brett, I had a chance to use a little bit of the software. Phil gave me a demo of our on the ZF1. It's definitely intuitive and fun, but I also can see that it's, you know you're, you're iterating mm -hmm. fast on this. I know you guys launched the pre-order campaign. Where are you guys at in terms of the software and also the hardware? Yep. So we launched uh, three weeks ago, and you can go online to reserve your light form. Um, that light form ships in November. So we actually already have a final um, hardware, so it's FCC CE certified. Um, we're actually shipping pallets of the hardware right now to a storage facility. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is working with select early adopters um, with a program that's already been sold out to refine the software and kind of get that process you know, uh, to where it's really smooth and you know, completely bug free. Uh, and then we'll be shipping out 2,000 Lightform units in November. Wow. Is software where you see the iteration mostly coming forward? In yep. In, in both user experience and just capability? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, the hardware kind of stays the same, um, but we actually have a free, a pro, and an enterprise version of the software, mm. and there's monthly updates. So we say that the hardware gets smarter every month because we're pushing updates, and that includes the free version. What things can you say are on your feature lists or your priority lists for things to get to users? Yep. So everything that we showed you in the demo outside of the stock video is actually in the free version. Mm. Um, so 100,000 searchable stock videos is in the pro version. Um, we're also adding support for multiple projectors, so being able to synchronize as a timeline across multiple projectors. Oh, just, just to have multiple displays, but not on the same object. Like, for example, this globe, the projector is going to hit this face, a bunch of other faces that I may want to project. Can you combine them? We're starting with uh, kind of separate scenes. Um, mm. So, you know, in the office, you could have all of these demos on a unified timeline and then have like triggers with, you know, like an iPad app. Um, to make them kind of all on a unified timeline so they're the same experience. And then down the road, eventually, we'll look into multi-projector support. But what we want to keep is the authoring process really easy. Um, and if you noticed, it's 3D data, but the authoring is in 2D. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what makes it really simple. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brett, for having us here. This has been super fun, and I never thought we'd see projection mapping done so easily. Um, with a device like that. Yeah, so we you know, just scanned this object as well and just showing off here we have an iPad app where I can change the size or the color of the effect. Right, so the effect is running real time on, on the hardware. Uh, and we created this you know, within whatever, 10 seconds and now it's permanently deployed. I, I know you, a lot of your target customer race is retail and, and location based type experiences, but I want this in the home. Yeah, well, that's why we built it, because we <laughs> want it in our own home too. So Awesome. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, it was really nice to meet you. Thanks. Okay, Jeremy, was that what you expected? It was. It was exactly what I expected. Um, 
Of course, now that I've seen this, I could think of what I want next. But what it is is exactly what I hoped for. I mean, I think that this is this fulfills that request that I had a year ago, where you could take one of these, aim it at your house at nighttime, and uh, you know, do some pretty interesting mapping. The, the thing I took away most with chatting with Brett and Phil there is how difficult this previously would have been to yeah. do, and why we don't see it in the world, why we only really see it in places like in retail and amusement parks and, and big setups against the side of buildings, yeah. and why it's not in the hands of people like you and me yet. I, I think traditionally, like the, to do good projection mapping, it's taken multiple disciplines, and it's shoehorned all of these technologies together yeah. in a way that's really effective, but very specialized. Right, I don't want to do that coding yeah. for the, the mesh, the, we, the, the geometry, the bending that light around there. I want to focus on the animation, the right. design, and a lot of these effects that they showed us made that really simple. Mm -hmm. Now, we were only there, we tried a few things. We tried the ZF1, we tried this globe, and it was effective for, for even like flat surfaces with, with outlines, right? That, those animations are cool. We didn't get to see the entire range of animations that they've built in, nor what it would take to make your own animations. Yeah, I was really intrigued by that too. So all the animations are actually shader based. Mm. And there's a tool out there called Shader Toy, which is a website you can go to, and it's basically a demonstration of what you can do with shaders, and you can contribute your own. Uh, and that's it, there's an enormous amount of, of possibilities when it comes to this kind of programming. Right. And so they were saying that eventually you should be able to do just about all of that on this device. Maybe limited by the processing power it of their, their mobile chipset. Right. And you know what we saw, the objects were small. We didn't get to see what it would look like if they use light form on the side of building, on a car, for right. example. And if you're throwing the projector longer distance, bigger, wider spread, does that mm -hmm. take more computation? Right. True, or like how many effects are you running at the same time? Yeah. We did see frame rate drops if you had multiple effects going, mm -hmm. and they don't cap that right now. They're trying to develop these effects uh, with a sweet spot in mind, but it's going to be up to the users to really take a look at the final effect and see is it meeting the frame rate that they want. And I know, you know, for, for the examples they had, even at like weddings, you know, lighting on the wedding cake or yeah. making signage look cool, that's like practical applications. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of like, I want to put this on our set. Right. Right. I want to use this against the tested backdrop, mm -hmm. against those hard edges and, and light it up, or for filmmaking. I could see filmmaking filmmakers using this. The cool thing about doing stuff like that is you don't have to use the whole throw of the of the projector. You yeah. don't have to like fill in all the gaps and put effects everywhere. You don't see the edge, that, that framing box that you normally would see when you shoot a projection image against the wall. Right, exactly, exactly. But just doing little subtle things, like having mm. something move around the, the background that we have yeah. here on the set, you know, even that would be very effective. And if you do it right, you can't tell it's projection mapping. You yep. sort of look at it and you're like, is that a light that is on that surface? Yes, yes, right, as opposed to putting an LED string in that. Exactly. And that's real light that bounces off and adds fill light to a yeah. person standing in front of it. So it's like, uh, watching like Alien or Blade Runner, right? All these science fiction films where you actually see a lot of projection mapping being used yeah. in the filmmaker in that futuristic world. This can happen in the real world. I love that there are shaders because it, it means it's real time and it yeah. means that you can have external um, you know, switches or sliders or any kind of input affect the effect whether it's the actual content, if it's text or if it's color or rate or anything like that. I mean, it, it's baby steps towards what could be highly interactive. You know, yes. if, it, if it's whether you're in a space where the people walking through, or maybe it's fed by web content, or eventually maybe in a video game. Well, that's the thing. Dynamic content is what they don't have yet. And they talk right. about being able to add Twitter feeds or text in the future. You want a computer interface. I want the, the, me be able to turn this ZF1 into my monitor. Right. That globe, any shape of device to be a mirror of my desktop, because then I can add interactivity. Mm -hmm. Then I can put sensors on that and have that change based on how I interact with it. Right, and are you also then talking about you want to be able to move that object around? Well, that's the thing they don't do also explicitly. It's static yeah. objects right now, and they talked about how when they first started as a company, yeah, they wanted to track objects in real time. That's an incredibly difficult computational challenge, and that's what, not what their product is aimed at, but yeah, of course, I want that in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So very cool light form. It is available for pre-order and they said they're shipping them later this year. We'd love to get one in and use it on our set. And it's again opens the possibilities of what you can do with art and creativity mm -hmm. using light. So thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you guys next time.